Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out. It's the Sophia Jacob Lecture Series Season 2, so I'm happy to see you all here. Um, before we start, just again, I'll say that uh, it's really important for us to keep the lectures free, and all of the presenters present for free, so we do have a, a, a donation bowl at the front. If anybody could consider sparing a donation for the presenters today, that would be awesome. There's also free posters out there at home. That was a collaboration between the presenters and Jordan. Um, so uh, tonight we're really happy to have two presenters who work in the field of curating art um, and writing about art. Deirdre Smith here in Baltimore um, and San Corman, who is the assistant director of White Flag Projects in St. Louis. Um, we think it's really cool that we have these two here to present because they've both curated ambitious exhibitions at Sophia Jacob and produced publications uh, with Sophia Jacob and both of the publications are out front. You can take a look at them and they're both available for free download on the Sophia Jacob website. So please do that to check out some of their writing. Um, so first off, we'd like to welcome Deirdre Smith. Um, Deirdre lives here in Baltimore while at the same time studying art history and teaching uh, in the graduate program at George Washington University. Um, so Deirdre's really involved in, uh, in a lot of ways, um, writing, curating, and her work with organizing Coward Shoe. Um, Deirdre continues to write about art and regional exhibitions on her blog, Experiential Surprise. And last September, Deirdre curated and wrote the catalog exhibition in Baltimore at Sophia Jacob, which was totally huge for us. Um, and we're just really excited and happy to have her here because she's been uh, totally influential and supportive as a collaborator pretty much from the very beginning. So let's have Deirdre come up. Can people hear me at this volume? Good? Bad? Good? OK. I've never spoken out of a microphone before. OK. I wanted to say thank you so much to David and Jordan and Stephen for um, running such a beautiful gallery and for doing this lecture series, um, which is such a nice addition to everything that's already happening in Baltimore. And I'm really honored to be speaking here tonight. Um, just going to wait a second for the slideshow to come up. But this is a paper that I wrote uh, last semester at GW um, as a part of, I guess, essentially a methods course where we were thinking about different historical models of art history and um, what's still relevant or useful today and critiquing various models from the past. Um, so I think you'll see that <coughs> as I go on with the paper. Passing through the outer ring of permanent collection galleries on the third floor at the Hirshhorn Museum, visitors are shown a history of American and European modernism driven by monographic displays of painting. A gallery dedicated to Jean Miro open, empties into one for Jean Dubuffet, followed by a single Philip Guston painting and a gallery of eight works by Francis Bacon. On my first trip ever to the Hirshhorn, a set of three paintings, a triptych in this last room, arrested on a comfortable leather seat placed in the center of the gallery, I sat and allowed my eyes to jump between the three panels, struggling to make sense of their distinct but nonetheless correspondent scenes. It was strange to me, this fascination, because the artist was one who had never had Only a few other occasions in my life came to mind when I had been similarly captivated, and they were all by quite different works by artists that I have a professed interest in. Richard Serra's Union of the Taurus and the Sphere at Dia Beacon, Gerhard Richter's Strontium at the de Young Museum in San Francisco, and Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon at MoMA, the sight of which caused me to suddenly and inexplicably weep on a trip with a friend two years ago. My experience with Triptych felt like a betrayal of the judgment of my intellect by the raw fascination of my eyes. Its effect has not worn off after a, over a year's worth of subsequent visits where I have always made a point to stop and sit with it. I'm often asked what kind of art I like, and I typically respond with any one of the following, contemporary art, conceptual art, or post-minimalist sculpture, I have never said painting, expressionism, or portraiture, terms that I might use to describe the three bacon canvases. Should I now reorganize the schema of my taste or expand my definition of how I use this admittedly vague term like? Do I mean simply what my research tends to be about 
or do I mean what I enjoy and what fascinates me? I heard Lucy Lepard draw a useful distinction between these two categories at a conference two years ago. She had presented what was essentially a long slideshow of artworks that she considered significant, focusing on feminist and environmental activist projects. Someone in the audience asked if people would not also benefit from looking at beautiful paintings, as much as such explicitly political work, and couldn't such paintings also be considered political gestures? Lepard responded that personally she loved landscape paintings, but they are not what she finds productive for her scholarship. In the following analysis, I turn my organization of these categories what one writes and what one enjoys on their head by writing about triptych. I will engage with questions of taste and interest with two aims in mind. First, I seek to describe and make sense of the Hirshhorn's triptych to myself, paying particular attention to the signature devices of Bacon's work that serve to abstract and confuse the body and the sense of space within the three paintings. Secondly, I will use my experiences to extend to a larger issue within art history. Art historians often write against taste, preferring to frame their arguments within, in terms of cultural significance. Yet so often in the midst of laying out some systematic line of reasoning, taste comes through, value judgments are made, and an unshakable attraction to art objects for their beauty, emotional resonance, or other inexplicable reasons is allowed to stand unquestioned. I will pay attention to a few key examples, such as passages from Alois Regal's The Group Portraiture of Holland from 1902 and Heinrich Wolflin's Principles of Art History from 1915, written explicitly against the indulgence of subjective experience and preference, and before a time when the acknowledgment of identity and subject positioning in art history were the norm, teasing out moments of value judgment in these works is particularly telling. I will also look to explorations of the notion of taste and aesthetic judgment by Edmund Burke, Immanuel Kant, and Roland Barthes, who provide methods for understanding and categorizing judgments of aesthetic value and significance. Ultimately, this paper aims at the question of how art historians might appropriately write taste into or out of their scholarship. What role should the concepts of beauty, greatness, and attraction take in the writing of art history? My inquiries into Francis Bacon have revealed that it is quite apt to discuss strong, almost inexplicable reactions to images in regard to his work. He was an artist whose practice was fueled by moments of fascination and horror in pictures. It is known that his Rees Muse studio in London, where he lived and worked for 30 years, was littered with images torn from magazines, tabloid newspapers, art books, and medical texts. The images that fascinated Bacon were often of the human body, and especially of violence and aberrations to it, such as unusual positionings of hands, heads, necks, and studies of the body in motion by Edward Moybridge. In interviews, Bacon commented on these source materials in a way that provide insight into how he looked at photographs and paintings. In particular, he discusses a relationship to painting that completely abstracts the subject matter at hand into formal associative schemas rather than narratives which is how he hoped viewers would see his own paintings. He discussed a desire to create non-illustrational painting that, quote, works first upon sensation and then slowly leaks back into fact, end quote. In other words, paintings that could create a raw emotional impact before a sense of narrative or even definite space. Describing a crucifixion by Cimabue that had inspired several of his own works, for example, his triptych, Three Studies for Figures at the Base of a Crucifixion, Bacon said, I always think of that as an image, as a worm crawling down the cross. I did try to make something of the feeling which I've had from that picture of this image just moving, undulating down the cross. This description completely obscures religious and psychological significance from Chimabue's image. To the extent to which three studies can be read as a work done after Chimabue's, Bacon has borrowed only color and the sense of undulating movement from the original. In contrast to the iconic dramatic image of Christ's suffering before his death, Bacon's version of the scene depicts a monstrous, worm-like creature with sharp teeth, no eyes, and a long neck, lashing out at its viewer. On my first visit with Triptych, I focused on the bodies, the violence, the contortions of figure that are so commonly associated with Bacon. The three scenes relate horizontally, which is a quality of Bacon's compositions that Gilles Deleuze references in The Logic of Sensation, his study of Bacon. Of Bacon's triptychs, Deleuze writes, quote, one discovers rhythm as the essence of painting, for it is never a matter of this or that object possessing rhythm. On the contrary, rhythms and rhythms alone become characters, become objects. I feel something of this when I spend time with the Hirshhorn triptych, as the movement of my eyes between panels and the seeking of various correspondences between scenes is so central to my experiences. 
panels of triptych display a parody that is nearly identical at parts. The middle panel, middle panel interrupts this flow. When I look at triptych, my eyes dart back and forth between the outer scenes before resting for long periods on the middle one. The space of this panel invites this kind of looking, as well as its subject. While cropped arcs that point outward beyond the scene of the compositional rhythm form the compositional rhythm of the outer panels, diagonals that extend from the outside in direct the composition in the center one. These four lines meet in the middle of the composition in a vanishing point and a black void. The two outer panels depict scenes of bizarre sexual violence, while the central one appears to be the aftermath of a murder. Rebecca Daniels, in an essay that references the Hirshhorn's triptych, observes that Bacon often painted murder in the central panel of his triptychs, and that the central panel is, quote, the most important panel in traditional religious art, often depicting the crucifixion, end quote. In both outer panels, a brown parabola at, tops inter at top interlocks with a light purple shape that extends beyond the frame of the composition, implying a curved wall. At bottom, a narrow cropped plane of chartreuse is cut by a brown arc, above which is another arced plane of green, this one modeled to resemble grass. Resting on the grass in both paintings are the legs of the platform on which the two sexual scenes appear. The bodies lie in heaps upon stepped platforms with curved mirrors facing them and reflecting back information about the rest of the space where the acts have taken place. For reasons that still confuse me, the legs supporting the narrative scenes cast shadows. Wan extensions of gray spread out on the grass behind them, adding further ambiguity to the location of these scenes. On my recent visits to Triptych, it is these types of questions that occupy my mind. Where in the world do these curved spaces exist? Why are bodies on display there? Who is the woman seems speaking on the phone in the rightmost panel? Um, and why does she not appear to occupy the same space as the heap of bodies, although she is reflected in a mirror in front of them? Deleuze interprets these various spaces as devices to isolate figures from each other, and more importantly, from narrative. However, I find that their ambiguity causes me to constantly spin narrative interpretations in my mind. The fact that Francis Bacon was briefly employed as an interior designer in his early 20s further implies that the creation of these ambiguous spaces and the attention to contour, texture, and color within them were highly intentional attempts to cast a specific mood and scene. In Camera Lucida, Roland Barthes describes the adherence of the referent or the resilience of the human subject within the photographic image. On his distraction by this persistent human referent from his inquiry into the essential nature of photography, by which he starts his book, he writes, quote, what did I care about the rules of composition of the photographic landscape, or at the other end, about the photograph as family right? Each time I would read something about photography, I would think of some photograph I loved, and this made me furious. Myself, I only saw the referent, the desired object, the beloved body, but an importunate voice, the voice of knowledge, of scantia, then adjured me, in a severe tone, get back to photography, end quote. In this statement, Bart refers back to the categorical separation of taste, like, and preference versus what is thought to be productive intellectually. However, rather than divorcing this discussion of photography from his interest in memory and the human referent, he writes this interest back into the center of his book. He does this in part through his notion of the punctum, which he outlines in contrast to the studium. The latter, Bart defines as operating on the plane of, quote, unconcerned desire, of various interest, of inconsequential taste, I like, I don't like. The punctum, on the other hand, breaks with this plane, its studium, and pierces the spectator. I would like to employ this notion of the punctum in my reactions to triptych, though I must first admit that I do so thoroughly against the grain of Bart's readings. My image is a painting, and the distinctions between painting and photography are far from trivial in Camera Lucida. Photographs are defined as fundamentally contingent, and punctums are accidental. As much as Bacon's process may have relied on a stream of consciousness, and as much as accidents really do play a part in the making of paintings, these differences must be acknowledged. Bart's emphatic turn toward interrogation of what fascinates and pierces him in photographic images, placing them at the center of what is compelling about photographs, rather than setting them aside as subjective, is I feel too close to my own concerns not to use. Returning to the Hirshhorn triptych, something in these three canvases pierces me, and I want to know why. Tracing the horizontal rhythms, my eyes move back and forth between the suggestions of faces and teeth in the two outer panels and the complete lack of a face in the central one. On the Hirshhorn triptych, Bacon commented that he knew from the start that the central panel would contain no figure. 
Indeed, all we see is a haunting suggestion of a figure that was. If I may point to the punctum of triptych, it is here in the central panel in the form of an oblong shape outlined in white in the center of the bloody mess of the composition. My eyes are drawn into this shape and get lost there. The shape suggests many things, a cross section of an organ, a shirt cuff, but at the same time it fails to be any one of them, which is all the more disturbing. It is this abstract quality of the triptych in the figural elements, as well as the ambiguous multifaceted spaces where the figures are isolated and displayed that interests me the most of all and returns me to the painting to further contemplate. My questions about who and where and why the scenes take place are ultimately unanswerable. And in reading more about Bacon and looking at more examples of his works, I find that this deep ambiguity is something that he relished and cultivated. At the beginning of this paper, I described my attraction to triptych as what felt like raw fascination. It seemed inexplicable and arbitrary in light of the fact that I had no precedent of connection with Bacon's paintings in the past. Now that I have provisionally settled the question of what it is that attracts me to the three paintings and how Bacon's choices may contribute to this feeling, I would like to turn to my larger question of taste and judgment within art history. There have been many attempts, both within art history and philosophy, to dismiss the validity of a notion of totally subjective, arbitrary judgment, specifically with regard to the judgment of what is great and what is beautiful. Edmund Burke writes in his essay on taste that superficially, we may seem to differ very widely from each other in our reasonings and no less in our pleasures, but notwithstanding this difference, it is probably that the standard of both reason and taste is the same in all human creatures. He argues this point beginning with very simple examples. Quote, all men are agreed to and honey sweet and aloes bitter, end quote. Going further, if a person comes to prefer the taste of tobacco to that of sugar, it is not because sugar is no longer sweet and enjoyable to their palate, but because he or she has grown to appreciate the taste of tobacco from experience. It is somewhat the same way with works of art or literature. According to Burke, someone with little knowledge of sculpture may look at a not great sculpture, but be pleased and struck by it only for the fact that they see a resemblance to the human figure in it. They will ignore its faults because they have not yet acquired the ability to discern greatness. While Burke acknowledges a universal taste, he admits that there are natural deficiencies and aptitudes when it comes to judging a work of art or of achieving the ability to recognize what may be deemed universally great. Quote, a rectitude of judgment in the arts, which may be called good taste, does in, in a great measure depend on sensibility. Because if the mind has no bent to the pleasures of the imagination, it will never apply itself sufficiently to works of that species to acquire a competent knowledge in them." End quote. In Kant's critique of judgment, he similarly rehearses the belief that taste differs completely between individuals. The first commonplace of taste is contained in the proposition under cover of which everyone devoid of taste is content um, Devoid of taste thinks to shelter himself from reproach. Everyone has his own taste. The second commonplace is that there is no disputing the judgment of good taste, and that therefore judgments cannot be based on concepts, because then they would be disputable. He seeks to resolve these claims by arguing that judgments of taste are based on concepts, but one that are, ones that are indeterminate. Earlier, he writes, there can be no objective rule of taste by which what is beautiful may be defined by means of concepts. For every judgment from that source is aesthetic i.e., its determining ground is the feeling of the subject and not any concept of an object, end quote. Kant does allow that there are certain judgments in which everyone has their own view, and that is judgments of the agreeable, defined as something which pleases on a personal level, writing, quote, a violet color is to one soft and lovely, to another dull and faded. To quarrel over such points with the idea of condemning another's judgment as incorrect when it differs from our own, as if the opposition between two judgments were logical, would be folly, end quote. Judgments of the beautiful are of a different matter. To make an aesthetic judgment, a person must be freed from any interest and desire in the object, which would render these judgments partial and impure. The beautiful is fundamentally defined as, quote, an object of delight apart from it, something which might be universally judged. If a judgment of the beautiful must be qualified as beautiful for me, it must not, in fact, be beautiful. At the same time that judgments of the beautiful are defined as needing impartiality and universality, Kant asserts that the rules for what guides aesthetic judgments cannot be logically or scientifically defined. Here we have two definitions of taste, slightly different, but both asserting that the notion that everyone has their own judgment of taste and aesthetics is not valid. 
Burke claims that variations in judgment and taste do exist, but are based on greater or lesser attention to the object at hand, and a greater or lesser aptitude of judgment. Kant claims that certain absolute conditions govern aesthetic judgments. Variations in judgment are valid in some cases and not in others. How do these issues play out in art history? In the preface to Alois Regal's study, The Group Portraiture of Holland, taste and subjectivity are defined pejoratively. Speaking to the aims of art history, he writes, some of us are convinced that the mission of our discipline is not simply to find the things in the art of the past that appeal to modern taste, but to delve into the artistic volition behind works of art and to discover why they are the way they are and why they could not have been otherwise, end quote. Here, aesthetic judgment is more than universal, it is explicable. Later, in a manner that evokes Kantian aesthetics, he writes that he hopes his book may also lead to a more impartial aesthetic appraisal of group portraiture. The dominant tendencies nowadays is to let the work of art vanish as a physical object and become absorbed into the inner subjective experience of the viewer. Regal lays out three periods of group portraiture, focusing on qualities of will, emotion, and attentiveness, which create hierarchies among the groups in the paintings, as well as varying levels of engagement for the viewer. His chapter on the third period, extending from 1624 to 1662, focuses on a great deal on paintings um, of groups by Rembrandt, such as The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Tulp and The Night Watch. Regal takes a clear delight in the paintings of Rembrandt and says that although the painter was, quote, the agent of the artistic volition of his nation and times, end quote, he was also, quote, an agent of genius and at times of consummate achievement, end quote. Although Regal has written in his preface that he is against the tendency to let the art object vanish into subjective experience, on the topic of the night watch, he writes that Rembrandt's paintings make, quote, a gripping subjective impression, end quote, on viewers as a result of, quote, the way in which the pictorial conception, particularly as represented by the outstretched hand of the captain, expresses the psychological intention of the figures, end quote. Here, Regal's taste in the form of his judgment of the genius and superiority of Rembrandt clearly comes through. He tries to define what is great about Rembrandt in terms of larger principles, such as the unity of will and action in the paintings, criteria that guide his descriptions of earlier scenes of group portraiture. However, one still gets the sense that on some level, Regal simply prefers these paintings to the others. It is not my intention simply to point out that Regal had a sense of taste or preference, because this is no surprise. Rather, I point out these moments of judgment because they are so central to his analysis, in spite of his claims otherwise. In Heinrich Wolflin's Principles of Art History, he too seeks to write against arbitrary judgments and to lay out methods for explaining what it is that makes a great work of art. In comparing two great painters, Raphael and Rembrandt, Wolflin writes that the important thing is not enumerating their differences, but rather to demonstrate, quote, how both in different ways produce the same thing, namely great art, end quote. But the same problem persists from Regal. What is greatness? Is there any way of really explaining what makes something great to oneself or to others? In an earlier passage, Wolfen compares two works for the purpose of attempting to demonstrate this quality of greatness. One is Botticelli's The Birth of Venus, and another, a nude study by Lorenzo di Credi. Describing the Botticelli, he, wrote, he writes, quote, the sharp elbow, the spirited line of the forearm, the radiant spread of the fingers on the breast, the energy which charges every line, that is Botticelli. Credi, on the other hand, produces a more flaccid effect." End quote. Botticelli's painting is described as objectively better, with words like spirited and radiant, while the Credi is simply and almost laughably flaccid. Yet these formal descriptions seem incapable of fully explaining what is clearly preferable for Wolflin, or for anyone, in Botticelli's painting. To contrast Regal and Wolflin with a more contemporary work of art history, I take Anne Wagner's Three Artists, Three Women, Modernism and the Art of Hesse, Krasner, and O'Keeffe as an example. Considering its date, 1996, and Wagner's explicit engagement with a feminist stance in this book, I am not surprised to find self-conscious references to the writer's subjectivity and personal judgments that are completely absent in Regal and Wolflin. I am, however, slightly surprised by a statement in the introduction where Wagner actually invokes these earlier art historians in a way that feels anachronistic. She's comparing her three subjects and claims that Eva Hesse's achievements are, quote, the greatest, end quote. Here, again, is that difficult term, and again, it is not readily explained. 
In this case, however, the statement is allowed to stand on its own, as it is framed fully as Wagner's personal judgment. She qualifies this statement with the words, I believe, and she makes no move to claim universality for her remarks. However, greatness is in many ways central to her project in the book. She wants to engage Hesse, Krasner, and O'Keefe as significant artists of modernism whose genders have tended to affect their careers and receptions. Although she treats the notion of greatness ambivalently and is historically charged, she still uses it descriptively. Greatness adheres within art history as the human referent adheres to the photograph in Bart. If Wagner's statement is any indication, it would appear that the progress within art history from the time of Regal and Wolflin with regards to judgment of taste has been the gradual acceptance of their ultimate subjectivity, working somewhat against attempts to systemize such judgments by Kant and Burke. Writers no longer need justify why they think something is great, but rather more generally, why they choose to write about a particular topic and by what methods. Terms like greatness and beauty may still get used, but a premium is now placed on the productiveness of subject matter and methods for the discipline of art history as a whole. In my own paper, I have mimicked, though somewhat unintentionally, these same structures. In the beginning, I admitted to having an attraction to a group of paintings that was inexplicable to me. Through my paper, I attempted to engage with what I find so interesting in these paintings, but did not come to a conclusive answer. I tried to justify my choice by writing about my subjective experience to the group of paintings by using these responses to gesture toward larger issues within art history. When asked by David Sylvester what made him choose to paint a series based on Velazquez's portrait of Pope Innocent X, one of his most famous, Francis Bacon said the following, it just haunts me. After my various attempts to discuss triptych, I am forced to ultimately conclude, as Bacon does of Velazquez's portrait, that these pictures also just haunt me, and that following Bart's model of the punctum, this may be an acceptable response. In regards to my questions of taste and value judgment within art history, I will conclude by saying that it seems that value judgment and taste operate within art history in manners acknowledged and unacknowledged. For once these subjective choices were justified by claims to a universal truth in terms of beauty and cultural significance, they can now be accepted as personal motivators within the discipline. Whether or not they are primary to its operations and progress remains the central conflict. The question is, what kind of art history do we want? One of taste, beauty, and greatness, or one of intellectual, political, semiological inquiries? If my own example is any indication, the distinctions between these categories are infinitely slippery. I have walked through life with a sincerely professed interest in the latter art history, but a dumbstruck half hour before a Francis Bacon painting has turned me on to the former. If moments of intense looking and raw fascination persist in spite all odds, the question of where to take them is most critical. Though for the time being, I will refuse a definitive answer. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions or? No? Um, the acts like the accidental element. Yeah, or something. I mean, like the something that can be pinpointed. Well, I mean, I, I think I attempted. I mean, for me, I said that it. I mean, I think Barr also defines it as something that's sort of personal. Like he's just attracted to these accidental moments. Like one of the examples he uses is a a photograph of nuns and soldiers, and he's just very interested in the fact that these nuns are in the picture with these soldiers. So I think personally, I mean, I tempted to say that that sort of like central bloody image is sort of like where my eyes get lost and sort of like what pierces me to some extent. But I think um, it's funny because like the accidental moment as I think actually below it, that white bit of paint at the bottom is really thick and it almost like Francis Bacon talks about just throwing paint at canvases at certain points when he was feeling frustrated with the project. So I think that's probably closer to like what actually Bart meant by the punctum. But I decided to just sort of use it a little bit differently than the way that he does because I was so interested in the fact that he um, 
decides to like write his own personal feelings into his theory and does it so effectively. So, yeah. Anything else? Okay, thank you. Oh, go ahead. Right, that bottom yeah, strip. I yeah, I didn't really engage with it here, but it's something that I definitely think about while I'm looking at the piece, because as I said, I think a lot about what the space of the paintings are because it's so ambiguous. And something I think about too is the um, curved forms at the top and how that's like the curved form of the building of the triptych, and I mean a building of the Hirshhorn. So I wonder if their choice in collecting this had anything to do with that, because they, they do give it a very prominent place in the museum. Um, right, there's a sofa right in front of it, which is, one of the few like sofas that they actually have in the um, in the museum at all. So I mean, I think that's, some, that's something that they're thinking about, and definitely creates this interesting idea of these ambiguous spaces. Um, but I didn't choose to discuss it. That's a good point. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>